Praise God. Well, we're in a series right now called Fellowship, and we've been uh, talking on these things for a few, a few weeks and just talking about um, being in the presence of God. We've been in a series, uh, we've been in a series called The Kingdom of God, but we, we kind of uh, transitioned into this one on fellowship and, and just had some things stirring in my heart about spending time with God, getting to know uh, God, and making sure that we spend time in His presence because I tell you, we're going through a lot of things right now, and I don't know if you feel it or sense it, and I, and I don't just mean by watching the news because I know you can watch the news and uh, if, if you watch the news, yeah, you're probably very stressed and full of anxiety. And I mean, we all watch the news to a degree. Uh, but if that's all you're feeding on, you're just probably in shambles. I mean, because there's just so many things going on to be uh, upset about or worried about or thinking about. Uh, but I don't mean that. I, what I mean is uh, just if you're a spiritual person, meaning that you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, just something feels different right now, you know. And I don't really exactly know what that is. I, the way I've said it to people is I, I just have this strong urgency in my spirit just to pay attention. Pay attention. That's the, the phrase I keep getting. Pay attention. Pay attention. And what does that mean? Well, it's not that much different than what Paul said regularly, which was stay awake. That's not much different than what Paul said or what Jesus said, just stay awake. Meaning, don't let yourself be lulled into a slumber. Don't let yourself uh, just be caught doing things the way you've always done. You know, drunk on entertainment, drunk on the spirit of this world. Just And he even uses that word. He says, no, stay sober. Stay vigilant. And he's not even talking about uh, alcohol in those moments. He's talking about a mindset. He's talking about in your spirit, staying sober, staying alert, staying vigilant. In other words, paying attention. And that's the, the phrase that I just keep getting in my, when I, and I'm not even saying for the church. I just mean for my own life, spending time with God, pay attention. You need to be, and, and, and this is how I think of that. Uh, you know, none of us know the future. None of us know what's coming around the corner. None of us know that. And, and if you've ever been uh, where you've had a guide in your life, a guide of any sort, maybe you went on a guided tour or a guided hike or a guided hunt or a guided fishing trip or anything like that. Uh, and I've led trips myself back in the day when I was doing you know outdoor trips with youth ministries and things like that. And there's certain parts where you would get on the trail. For example, we did a trip in uh, Rocky Mountain National Park up Long's Peak where there was a section of the trail where it is called, it actually is called the Narrows and, and it got really narrow. And I mean, I, I'm doing this, but it may have been a little wider than that, but that's how it felt to me. And so we're taking a group across this path, you know, and it's a, st a steep cliff face. If you, if you go off that, it's over. There's no recovering from that. We're not even going to send a team after you because we know you didn't, you didn't make it if you fall off the side there. But we're going across this section and it's like that if you've ever had a guide where all of a sudden, you know, they've been letting you kind of goof off and do your own thing and all of a sudden they turn to you and say, now I need everybody to pay attention. I need everybody to pay attention right now because this next section is dangerous and this, section, this next section is really important and it's, if you were goofing off, it's time to stop goofing off. It's time to pay attention because there's a lot at stake. And that's how it feels in the spirit to me right now. And I'm just telling you that as your pastor. I'm not prophesying anything. I'm not predicting anything. I'm just telling you um, that our role as Christians and, and a big part of our life is to stay in tune with the Holy Spirit and to listen to Him. There's a lot that we do or don't do in this church and in life that is just simply by the leading of the Holy Spirit. A lot of things that look really good. A lot of things that make a lot of sense naturally. But in your spirit, just from spending time with God and from prayer, you go, I, this, something don't feel right about this. Something don't feel right about this. And so you pause and you, and you stop. I've explained it like a stoplight. You know, if you're driving and you got a green light, man, you know what that means. Right? Foot to the floor. Just keep on going. Nothing's in your way. Green light, just going. If you got a red light, you know what that means. This is a definite no. It's a, whoa, stop. Don't go any, far, any, any further. And then you have a yellow light. 
And it, it, it just means slow down, caution, pay attention. When, when my kids were probably two or three, four, I don't know how, they were sitting in the back seat. And uh, I don't know, we got on the conversation somehow and they said, you know, what's green light mean? Go. What's red light mean? Uh, stop. What's yellow light mean? Speed up. I said, you've been watching your mama drive too much, son. That, no, that is, it does not mean speed up. No, it means slow down. It means caution. And that's how it feels in the spirit right now to me, is as I pray and spend time with God, which I've been doing more and more in this season, there's just a, there's a caution. And I would say to every believer, you need to pay attention. If you are distracted, if you've been doing things the way that you've always done, if, if you haven't woke up, so to speak, to realize that things are a little bit different right now and, it, and you need to really latch on to what God is doing, then you're missing something. And some, some of us are too wrapped up into the things of this world and, and some of us are even sitting here going, I have no idea what you're talking about and that's your first problem, if that's the case. Because it shows how out of tune you are with what the Spirit's doing. And what's going on in the world? No, you should know something in here is different. You should know that if you have the Holy Spirit in you. But some of us are so out of tune and out of touch because we're, we're just yielding to the flesh. We live in the flesh. Everything's by the flesh. But how many of you know that we are a spirit created in the image of God and that we have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us? And I'm telling you, He will guide you. He will lead you. He is your guide and just like those guided trips I was talking about, we should be walking with our eyes on Him. Somebody told me that one time. I forget what situation we were in. They were like, I don't get, I don't, I don't get afraid until I see you're afraid. Because when something starts happening, they watch you. Okay, is he upset? Okay, no, everything's fine. If I see you getting afraid, now I know we ought to really pay attention. I don't even remember what that was. But it's, it's like that same thing. If we're walking with the Spirit and everything's fine in here, I can ignore what's going on in the news. I can go, the Holy Spirit seems fine with it. That means nothing, it ain't a big deal. You know, there's lots of, everyone else is upset. Lots of stuff is going on. Everybody's upset. I go, yeah, but in my, in my spirit, it feels like it's peaceful. No problem. I'm not worried about it. It doesn't seem like the Holy Spirit is upset. On the other hand, there could be nothing going on. I mean, it could all seem at peace. Doesn't it say it's going to be like that in the end anyway, like the days of Noah? Everybody marrying, drinking, doing just like, like life is all normal. And then all of a sudden, something changes. Well, how many of you know you can know that in your spirit in advance? See, the Bible, the Bible says that uh, when the Christ returns, it'll, it'll be like a thief coming in the night. He said, when you least expect it, it'll be like a thief that comes in the night. He said, but then he's talking to Christians. He says, except you are not going to get ca caught off guard like a thief in the night because you have the spirit on the inside of you. And you're in tune with what is happening. So this doesn't happen by accident, okay? If we're going to be in tune with the Holy Spirit and we're going to understand the times, because Jesus addressed this as well with the Pharisees. He got frustrated with them. And he said, they were just so out of tune. I mean, boy, if you think about this, it's, we're in the, during the Gospels, we're in the moment of moments where the Messiah, Jesus God in the flesh, Son of God, is now walking on the earth. How many of you could agree maybe the, probably the most important moment in all of history? Okay, nothing like it before, nothing like it after. This is the moment of moments. This, this is like the whole creation plan climaxing at one moment where Jesus is, is here in the flesh and the Pharisees who know the Old Testament, they know all the Old Testament prophecies, they teach it to other people, they, the scribes, they write it out for other people, but yet somehow they're missing it. And Jesus got frustrated with that, and he said, how is it, how is it that you guys can predict the weather? He's like, you can look at the clouds, you can look at the sun, you can tell, if it's, it, tell, tell us if it's going to rain or not. But he said, when it comes to spiritual things, and by the way, you're the, you're the guides and the leaders, for, supposed to be spiritual leaders for all of these people, how is it that you can't discern what God is doing in the Spirit? You can look at the clouds and you can tell what's happening with the weather, but you can't discern what God is doing in the Spirit. Well, what we're dealing with there is things you can discern by the natural and things you can discern by the Spirit. Now, discerning things in the natural comes very easy to us because you can see it with your five, you can experience it with your five senses, right? So, 
If I, if I held up this bottle of water and I said, describe it to me, well, you're going to use your, your eyes, you're going to see it, you could touch it, you could feel it, you could open it, you could try to smell it, you could shake it, you could hear it. Your five senses can discern a lot about this, but discerning spiritual things is not quite like that. So discerning natural things comes a lot easier to us, but discerning spiritual things has to be learned. It's not our second, it's, it's not our first nature. It's not our first inclination. This is why when people try to hear from God, even though you're really only going to hear from God in your spirit, when people try to hear from God, they try to go to the natural. It's a lot easier to say, God, if you want me to do this, when I walk outside, let me see, you know, four red trucks passing in a row right in front of me. <laughs> if that's you, God, let me see that. You're not going to hear from God that way. That's just foolishness. You're not going to hear from God. That's not how God speaks to His people. The Bible says the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. So you're going to be led by the Spirit. Why don't we like that? Because most of us don't know how to do that. And it's so much easier to be led in the natural. What do we want? Well, we'd rather see an angel appear with a message. We'd rather see a vision. We'd rather have a dream when it comes to being led by the Spirit or, or hearing from God. But do you know that those things are few and far between? Very, 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 very rare. Matter of fact, I've never had one. I've never had an angel show up. I've never had open vision. I believe in them. They're in Scripture. Don't get me wrong. The Bible is clear on that. They happen in the book of Acts. Some, some people do. I've never had that. But I've been led by the Spirit every day. I can hear from God on a regular basis. You, you might, even if you have a dream or a vision, it might be once, twice in your life. If you ever see an angel, it'll be a one-off experience. But I'm telling you what, I need to hear from God on a daily basis. So I don't depend on that. And the Bible's clear anyway. Just so you know, we hadn't got into the sermon yet. This is just, I don't even know what, this is the preamble. I, we had not even got to the first scripture. But, see, people depend on that because it's their natural senses. I could, I could see that with my eyes. I could hear that with my ear. Then I would know it was God. Yeah, but that's not the normal way to, to be led. And the Bible tells us even if you did get a message from an angel, he said you would still have to judge it by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God that's on the inside of you. Why? Because there's, there, the Bible says that Satan comes as an angel of light. And there are things that people get off on and wrong on as well. There are deceptive things that happen. But you know what's, what, what, where you'll never miss it is by the Word of God and His Spirit that's on the inside of you. So the times that we're living in, it's very, very crucial that our fellowship is, is closer. And as difficult times come and things start to change, that's your time to close the gap and close the distance between you and your God to get right up to him shoulder to shoulder, maybe holding on to his shirt, and wherever he goes, you're going with him. And when you have this big gap, and you, you're over here playing, and you're doing, and you're not paying attention to what God's doing, you can miss it. I mean, this isn't going to come news to us, because the Bible tells us that in the last days, many people are going to fall away. Well, they're not going to fall away by following the Holy Spirit. The only way they're going to fall away is because they were not following the Holy Spirit. They let that gap increase too big. The other day, I was, I was, uh, I was somewhere with some friends, and we looked up. And there was a big V of geese flying through the air. And they're just honking, you know, and they're flying. You got that lead, <laughs> you got that lead goose in the front, and that big V is just flying, and they're honking, boy, and they look all in perfect line. And it just, we're watching it pass, you know. I was like, that's pretty cool. And then about, it felt like a minute later, there was this straggler goose coming, <laughs> he's way behind, you know. I'm like, man, I've never seen that before. What happened? You know, I guess they all took off and he was over piddling with something and they're gone. And the next thing he knows, where's the V? I, I don't know. He's honking way behind. That's some of us. <laughs> God's moving. Holy Spirit's moving. You know, and then we're like that because we wake up. We go, oh, oh, Lord, what happened? And we're just, you know, trying to, trying to catch up. Well, I don't want to be playing catch up. I want to have my eyes on Jesus. If, if, he, if he blinks... I want to know. If he twitches, I want to know. And I'm not saying I'm perfect at that, but that, that, I'm just saying that's my heart and that's my mentality, is to, to be in tune with what God is doing spiritually. Amen? Amen. Now, how's that going to happen? It doesn't happen because you hear a good sermon. 
It doesn't happen because you're here this morning and you go, oh, I want that. Well, wanting that is just the start of what you need to do from, from here forward. Because it's something that is developed. You don't snap your fingers and arrive at that place. It's something that is developed. No different than if I motivated you on, on starting to do aerobic exercise. You could get all super motivated, but, but leaving out, you haven't done anything yet. All you did was get motivated, and then on Monday, the real work starts, right? That consistency, that daily exercise, that's how it begins. So the sermon is just to motivate us to go, man, I'm going to start doing this every day. I'm going to start pursuing this every day. I'm going to start investing into this area of my life every day. And that's how it is developed. Luke chapter 5, verse 15 I want, to, I want you to look at this with me, and we're going to start here this morning. Luke chapter 5, verse 15. Now, you may think, well, man, you're just getting into the sermon now. You know, you already burned 15 minutes. Well, if you're new with us, all right, let me just let you know, I generally preach about 45 minutes, and then I shut her down. Don't worry about it, okay? If we don't get through all of it, we'll just come back next week. So I don't, I'm not going to hold you. But how many think it's important to listen what the Holy Spirit is trying to say to us? Because I... I've learned this as a pastor, that you could have your notes, you could do whatever, but sometimes God's trying to say something to us, and that's the most important thing, is that we hear what He is saying. Amen? Amen. So Luke chapter 5, verse 15, we're going to look at, just for a second, an aspect of Jesus' life, because... You know, I think about the life and ministry of Jesus, and I think, how did he do what he needed to do? How did he accomplish what he needed to accomplish? How did he make it? He did what no other man could do. He lived the perfect, sinless life. He accomplished every aspect of what God sent him to do. Uh, none of us, I don't, I don't believe, will ever fully understand what Jesus really did until we get on the other side. And I don't think we'll ever understand how difficult it was to do what he did until we get on the other side and we can have that fully explained to us and get that revelation. But, but do you think that Jesus was not tempted to sin? Well, I mean, the Bible tells us he was. The Bible says he experienced every temptation that you experienced, that man has experienced. He, but he did it without sin. And you go, well, he was God. Well, the Bible also says he was man. He was God, he was man. And he experienced that same temptation, and he did it by, as a man. Why? Because the Bible said that he emptied himself of the power of God. That he, he emptied himself of his God side to become man and to do what he did. But he did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, in Luke chapter 5, verse 15, it says, But now even more the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities, but... He would withdraw, everybody say withdraw. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. And I've often looked at this and thought about what prayer really is, and I thought to myself, why did Jesus pray like this? And, and you see this so often. I could go through and read you dozens of scriptures where... He withdrew, he got alone, sometimes all night with God. And I go, why did he do that? Did he do that because he just liked talking to God? That may have been part of it. Did he do it because he wanted to do it? But here's a bigger question. Did he do it because he needed to do it? Because he had to do it to accomplish the call and the, w and the will of God on his life? And I wondered that. That's an important question. Was Jesus praying, was Jesus' prayer life optional? In other words, could he have fulfilled his call had he just never prayed? Was he praying just because he wanted to and he liked it? Or was he praying because he had to and without it, he could not have fulfilled the call of God on his life? He could not have fulfilled the mission he was sent to do? It's a good question. It's an interesting question. Now, if you look at the life of, of Jesus and you look at his ministry in the wilderness... He goes and he's tempted by Satan for 40 days. He fasts and prays for 40 days. This is how Jesus began his ministry. This is how he started the whole thing, by fasting and prayer. Then you watch in scriptures like this, you see where during his ministry he withdrew often. 
to desolate places to get alone with God. And in those moments with God that he would be sustained and he would be refreshed. Then at the end in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before he goes on the cross, he's, he's going to the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying. And the Bible says that angels came and ministered to him and brought him strength and encouragement. So if you look at the life and ministry of Jesus... In the wilderness, Jesus began his ministry in prayer. Then he sustained his ministry through prayer. Then he ends his ministry and finished his ministry in the garden with prayer. It was such a life source for him that he did it on a regular and on a constant basis. That he would pull away and he would get alone with God. I submit to you. If you want to know the secret of Jesus' life, it's his prayer life. If you want to know why he was able to endure all the way to the end, why he was able to do what he did was because of his connection to the Father. And any time he needed to withdraw to get strength, he did it. Sometimes he offended people by doing it. A lot of times when the crowds would get really big and the demands would get really big, he would withdraw. Nobody could find him. What's he doing? He's off praying. The apostles sometimes were looking for him. Where yet? He's off praying. Sometimes he prayed all night. And I believe that this is, the, this is a significant part of anybody's life that's going to do anything great for God. Their prayer life is going to be at the center of what they do. I like what Leonard Ravenhill said. He made this statement. He said, a man is no greater than his prayer life. Meaning, whatever you're going to do is never going to exceed your prayer life, your devotional life, your fellowship with God. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul said this. Now, this is a familiar scripture. We're going to go actually verse 12. And most people know verse 13. But I want you to really look at what Paul is saying here. Philippians 4, 12. He says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And it is this, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So Paul, who went through a, a lot of really difficult things and a lot of big challenges, he said, I've learned, I've, he said, I've had it. I've had it where things are good. I've had it where things are bad. I've had it where I'm struggling or it's difficult. He said, I've had plenty. I've had lack. I've been in every good place. And he said, but I have learned how to be the same no matter what my circumstances are doing. I, I've learned how to remain in the, in the same place spiritually as far as emotional health, spiritual health. I've learned how to remain in the same place whether things are really good or things are really bad. This is a secret for him. And if you were Paul and you had things changing like that in your life on a regular basis, you had, you know, one day everybody's with you, the next day everybody's turning against you. One day you're in a good place preaching and eating well and serving in a church. Next day you're shipwrecked and being beaten. And it's, it's like, man, things could change at any moment. And he said, what I've learned to do is to quit vacillating and oscillating with my circumstances. I've learned to... I've learned to stop going up and going down and depending on what's happening in my life. When things are good, when the economy's good, when my marriage is good, when my things in my job are good, he said, I'm, I'm happy. But then things fall apart. He said, I'm still happy. I'm still good. And I learned the secret. I learned the secret to stop this roller coaster of going up and going down and being good and being bad. He said, I've learned the secret and it is this. Is that actually... I can do all things, good, bad, horrible, great. He said, actually, I can do all things when I receive my strength from Christ. Now, this wasn't some magical... How do you think Paul received his strength? He said it was Christ that was strengthening him. How did that happen? That just magically happened because he was a Christian? What's he talking about? Paul have some other way to get strength from Christ that we don't know about? No, he had to get it the same way Jesus got it. He had to get it the same way you and I have to get it. It's by going to God in prayer and fellowshipping with God and reading our Bibles and worshiping in prayer. No, that's where we receive our strength. So listen, anytime you are on the point 
of failure, anytime you are at the point of burnout, anytime you're on the point of giving up, anytime you are at your wit's end, what you're really saying is you haven't learned this secret. You haven't learned how to get your strength from your prayer life. A lot of times when people are going through stuff and they're just everything's falling apart and they're and I'm not talking about their circumstances because Paul had it both ways. He had all of the circumstances falling apart and he had them when they were good. But I'm talking about spiritually and emotionally. Anytime you're falling apart and you're just at that breaking point and you don't know how you're going to make it another day, what you really just told us is that my prayer life is in shambles and my prayer life is not where it needs to be. My devotional life is not where it needs to be because if it was, I would be getting a strength that would cause me to be able to endure this no different than the good times. And the only reason that I'm feeling the way that I'm feeling right now is because I've let my prayer life go to the point that I'm, I'm very unhealthy. So see, when, when circumstances change, your prayer life has to change. When things get really hard and really difficult, and maybe you, maybe you had your prayer life down here, and your circumstances were here, and so it matches, and then you could just get by on a little five minutes here, five minutes there, and you feel great. Everything's fine. But all of a sudden, you start going through something, and you don't change this. You don't change the, the fellowship. You don't change the communion. You don't change the strength that you are drawing from God. No, when you start going through something, you've got to go deeper into God. You've got to go deeper into the Word of God. Deeper into time with God so that you're drawing that strength. This is the secret that Paul's talking about right here when he says, I've learned the secret of facing plenty, facing hunger, abundance and need. He says, no, actually, I can do all things. In other words, there's no limit to what I can go through as long as I'm drawing my strength from God. If I start going something through something really difficult, all I've got to do is, in, is turn up the valve over here and more strength starts coming in. I could, I could live in any circumstance. See, that's the reality. But we are so in tune with our five senses and our natural side that we don't know how to do that, many of us. So I want to talk to you about this because we're in this series, we're going to end up talking a lot about our spirit we're going to talk a lot about our flesh, nature, sin, nature, things like that, because man is actually made up of three parts. And when we interact with each other, we only know the natural part. You know, when I see you, I see your eye color, your hair color, your skin color, your body type and shape, and I see that, but that's only one part of you, which we could preach a whole sermon on that, right, about the problems we get into when we just judge people by one part. That's a lot of problems going on in the world right now with that. But a lot of issues with that. But, but actually, all of our spirits are the same. Because our spirits come from God. And it doesn't matter what you know, part of the world you come from or what different... You like. Actually, the Bible says that in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. He even says there's neither male nor female. He says in Christ... Our spirits are what matters. That's the real you. What you're looking at out here, this is just your shell. And people will fight over it and argue over it and talk over it. It's like, man, this is just a shell. But the real you is your spirit. It's the spirit that's on the inside of you. And I'm going to show you this. As a matter of fact, what does Paul mean when he says, I, I can do all things? What does he mean? Does he mean his body? What's he referring to when he says, I can do all things? He's talking about the real him, the real Paul. Paul, the Spirit, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What does he mean when he says me? Does he mean that Christ is strengthening his physical body? No, I don't think that's what he's referring to. That his having great physical strength is not going to cause him to be able to go through any and every circumstance. We know that. What does he mean when he says Christ is strengthening me? Is he talking about his mind? Does he talk about his does he mean his mind is getting really smart and intelligent and that's what's helping him go through? No, that's not what he's talking about. When he says it's Christ who strengthens me, he's referring to his spirit. Because he's saying I receive spiritual strength which which then allows me to go through anything. See, and you could have tremendous physical strength. You could be an Iron Man. You could be the most physically fit person in the world. 
at the same time, you could have you could have an IQ of you know 170. You could be the smartest person in the world, but if your spirit is weak, that doesn't mean you can go through anything just because you're physically fit and mentally strong. No, the real you is your spirit. The real you is your spirit, and your spirit gets its strength from God. First Thessalonians five twenty three. See, Paul knew this, and so we get this in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. He says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul's talking about sanctification, and, and that means being, that just simply means being set apart as holy for God dedicated to God. You know, if I said, if, uh, like, like whenever Hannah had uh, the prophet Samuel and she said, you know, I, I'm setting him apart for God. That's what she meant, sanctify. That's the word sanctify. So when we are sanctified in Christ, it means set apart as holy. I'm not going to use my body for darkness and for sin. Why? Because my body is sanctified as holy for God. And sanctification is a process. So Paul talks a lot about this, you know. He, he talks about the tongue, and he says, man, it, it's not right that a sanctified tongue should be used for evil and harm and tearing down, and, and at the same time used for uplifting and encouragement. He said, that's not right. He said, should, should poison water and fresh water flow out of the same stream? No. He said, that, that tongue is supposed to be sanctified for God. And in other places, he talks about the members of our body, and he says, should, should your body be used to sin and to further darkness while at the same time used to worship and praise God and, and strengthen the body? No, he said it shouldn't be like that. Well, that's a problem with sanctification. See, you're not set apart exclusively and solely and wholly for God. You're trying to use your, your body for both sides, your shell, your outward man. So what Paul's saying here is, he says, I'm praying that God would sanctify you completely. Meaning that your body would be set apart for God, your soul would be set apart for God, and your spirit would be set apart for God. See, a lot of people, when they got saved, their spirit was sanctified for God. But they're still struggling with sanctifying their body for God. And see, that's why when the Bible says uh, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, any man, if any man is in Christ, he becomes a new creation. Old things have passed away, all things become new. Well, he's talking about your spirit. It's your spirit that was born again. Your body wasn't born again. And whatever your body was like when you got saved, it was still like that, right? If you were short, you were short. Tall, you were tall. White, you were white. Black, you were black. Whatever your body looked like when you got saved, that stayed the same. But your spirit was born again to God. That's why he says, all things become new in your, in your spirit. He said, but now sanctifying your body? He said, that's going to be a process. And that's going to be a struggle that we continue with until the day we die. So here he's praying. He says, I'm praying that God will sanctify you, though, completely. Not just your spirit, but also your body and your soul, he says. Now, some people don't know, even know that there's a difference between your spirit and your soul. But the Bible does make a, a distinction between your spirit and your and your soul, it's, it's beyond our scope to get into it this morning. But what you need to know, here's a basic idea of it. Man is a spirit, he has a soul, and he lives in a body. And that is the basic understanding that you need to have of what a human being is. When I see you, I need to see beyond just your body because the body is probably the least important part of who you are. I mean, that's how we judge people. But in the New Testament... Paul said, I don't, he said, we used to even think about Christ that way. We used to think about Jesus that way. He said, but as it is now, he said, I don't judge anybody according to the flesh. Why? Because it's not the most important part. The most important part is the spirit and what's going on in the spirit. The most important part is our classification is I'm a son of God. You're a son of God. I'm a son of God. You're a daughter of God. And as that, the Bible says we're co-heirs, joint heirs with Christ, like that matters way more than our shell, right? So what he's praying for here, he says, I'm praying that you would be sanctified unto God, set apart as holy completely, not just your spirit, but your body and your soul. 
as well. Now, what is your soul and how might it differ from your spirit? Well, I've heard it explained this way, that <clears throat> your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. We're going to get a little bit of clarity on this in a minute just by looking at the Greek words uh, that are used here. But I would say this. I would say we know probably the most about how to strengthen the physical body. I would say that's probably easiest enough for us to understand is the, the physical body part of who we are. Like we, we, there's just been so much science, there's been so much medical research. We know so much about how to strengthen the body. Last week we talked a little bit about nutrition and applying that to spiritual nutrition. So we, we know a lot about our physical bodies, right? We know about the organs and the blood and the cells. We just, down to the cellular level, we just have such a tremendous understanding of the physical body. Then when it comes to the soul, well, the word used for soul uh, in the Greek is suke, which is where we get our word uh, psyche or psychology. So we know a lot about that too. We know a lot about psychology, probably not as much as we do about the physical body. There's an element of mystery still to psychology and the, and the psychological function of man. But that's what, he, that's what the Bible describes as your soul. So in many people, they're very unhealthy in their soul. That's why they don't go see a doctor, a phys physical doctor for that. They go see a counselor or a psychologist because their soul is unhealthy. Their body may be healthy, but their soul is not healthy. But then the third part, the most important part, which is the spirit. And I think that the spirit is probably what we know the least about. I think we know most about the body. I think we know a little less about the, the soul and the psychological part. But I think when it comes to the spirit, this is where we have the, the least understanding of how it really functions, even though it's the most important part. So let's get into it this morning. What is the spirit? What is your spirit? And really what we're asking is, what are you? What are you? Well, the word in the scripture that is used for spirit is the word pneuma. And this is so enlightening because this word literally means breath of life. Breath of life. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God formed the body. He formed Adam. The Bible says he formed it out of dust. So we have a body that's not alive yet. He formed, uh, Genesis 2, 7, Then the Lord formed the man of dust from the ground. And at this point, he's a, he's a physical body. He's laying there. He's lifeless. He has a body. He formed the man of dust from the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Literally, when God went to bring life into man, he breathed into him. Now, we could get into, well, does God have lungs? God have to breathe to stay alive? I don't think God was breathing here for, for his uh, survival. Literally what he did was he breathed a part of his spirit into Adam. And when he breathed into Adam, the Bible says the breath of life came into him. And from there on out, the Bible calls this word spirit. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, this word is used over and over again, spirit. But when you look at the words that's behind it, it literally means breath of life. So what is your spirit? It is literally God breathed into you. That is why the Bible thinks of the spirit, the Bible thinks of the spirit this way. That when, when a person comes to life, the spirit comes in, and he says when a person dies, that spirit leaves and returns to God from which it came. Now at that point, that spirit will be judged. It may not remain with God because it, it may be judged and sent somewhere else. But when a, when a spirit leaves the body, it returns to God who sent it. Now, I've sa I said this last week, but I think it bears repeating because it's so important. As your, your spirit is literally was breathed into you by God, and it is part of God, and God's spirit is eternal. It cannot be quenched. It cannot be killed. So this is, this is one of the most important things you have to understand about being a spirit. 
by creation, by definition, you are an eternal being. Your spirit cannot die. Okay? Demons also were created beings. They were in angelic beings. When they rebelled against God, they have no body, and presumably they are spiritually dead, yet somehow they're still alive. How is that? Because they are created beings that came from God. They cannot die. They cannot be quenched. Once a spirit comes into existence, it cannot be killed. It is eternal because God is eternal. This is why heaven and hell exist. It exists for the spirits that have left their body and have left this earth. So when you die, what we're referring to is your physical body, which is the least important part of who you are. But the real you will never die. This is so important for us to grasp because it changes how we think about everything. Your time spent in this physical shell, your time spent in this physical body will be the shortest part of your life. It will be the, mo the smallest, most insignificant part of your life. After your shell dies and your body dies, your spirit is going into eternity and that's when real life begins. Your body, is just, it's very, very temporary. Very, very temporary. I mean, there was a time where people's bodies, in the, in the Old Testament, there was a time where people's bodies lived eight, nine hundred years. Now, we don't live barely a tenth of that. So, there was a time where our, our time on this earth was eight, how many of you know even that, eight, nine hundred years was just like a breath, like a, a, a blink compared to eternity. I mean, when you've been in heaven, you've been in eternity with God for 10,000, 100,000, 100 billion years, and you think about 80 years on this planet, it's, it's nothing. The Bible calls it a breath. It calls it a, a, just a, a burst of air. It's just a mist. But we live because this is all we know, and because the, the natural is so real to us, we live like this is all there is. It's not. It's just a breath. It's quick, and then it's over. And then your shell... It's going to rot. It's going to decay. It's going to go back to the dust from which it was formed. I mean, it's kind of funny when you think about it, and I'm not making light of it. I know all of us have experienced funerals and things like that. But it, it's, it could be, if you look at it from one angle, a little bit humorous, the way that we do funerals and things like that. It's like we buy the casket, and it's got to be this nice, and we've got to do the flowers, and we're just like, man, this body, nobody's in that body, man. <laughs> There's no one there. It's just, it's, just, it's, just, it's just the shell. And we should. We should honor and do all that and remember their life and all of that. But as a Christian, how many know we're supposed to think about death differently than the world? The Bible says we shouldn't mourn the same way as, as uh, regular people do because we know that spirit is not in that body. And funerals are very sad times usually. You know, people are crying and they're upset because there's a separation. But I'm telling you, whoever was in that body, that spirit, when that spirit left... If they went to be with God, they wouldn't come back if they could. They're not shedding any tears. They're dancing on streets of gold. They have, they have come to life in the truest sense for the first time. And so that's all of us. One day your spirit is going to be reunited with God and you are going to experience life in a way that you have never experienced it. You're going to understand things. You're going to see God in a way that you've never seen Him. But you're here for a very short, temporary time as a spirit. That's the most important part of you. But you're in a body. And you're bound by this body and you're limited by this body. But one day you're going to be set free from that body. And you're going to be with God providing that you have received salvation. So what is a spirit in the most simplest uh, Form and the way it's most often described in Scripture is what is spirit? It is literally the breath of life that came into you from God. So when you're walking around every day, don't think of your... We've got to change our mindset. I don't want to think about myself defi defined by this. You know, I'm a... Let's see, I just, I'm about to be 40. I'm 39 now. I've started experiencing a couple little things. There's nothing, I'm sure, to some of you. Like, I know some of you are thinking, 40? I'd give anything to be 40 again. Well, <laughs> but I just a, few, just a few little things that, you know, when I was 20, I didn't have to deal with. And 
just a few little things. You know, like, for example, you, you experienced an injury, and when you, were, when you were young, you're like, I ain't nothing. I ain't even going to the doctor. It'll be fine. I'm like, man, if I don't do something, this may be this way for the rest of my life. Like, if I don't fix this, I don't think it's going to just heal on its own. I just, all of a sudden, things don't heal anymore like they used to. I don't know what happened with that. But I don't even know where I was going with that. But... <clears throat> <laughs> but the point, the point is, is that, you know, our, we're, we're in these physical bodies, and they are. They're breaking down. They're decaying. But, but what happens is your, your spirit, though, is not. Your spirit is alive unto God. And this shell, you, we ha- it's, it can be discouraging and disappointing to watch it literally break down before your eyes. Your muscles get weaker, and your, you age, and your hair starts falling out, and you start having problems and age and all these things. You're just getting closer to being set free from this body and to where you can actually live as the spirit that God created you to be. And it's not, death is, for a Christian, death is not something that should be feared. Death is something that should be looked forward to. I I know that's crazy. But see, I'm not hanging on to my life. I'm not. I'm here actually as an assignment, as in an act of duty and loyalty to God. But I've already learned a long time ago, it would be way better to be present with the Lord than to be uh, apart from Him on, on this earth. See, some people, some, this is why we have so many messed up ideas is because we really don't understand this. Somebody dies and they think, oh God, you know, they get mad at God. I'm like, you know, let's set aside for a moment whether God had anything to do with them dying or not. Let's just all look at it and go... They are in such a better place. But we can't think like this because we're so, we're so flesh, we're so in tune with the flesh and in the nature of things that we don't realize for anybody that dies and they died with Christ, they are 1,000 million times better off than they were here. But we don't think like that because we just, we think about the body. But yeah, but the body, look, if you live till you were 40 or till you were 90, On the other side of eternity, it literally makes no difference as far as long life is considered. So, we've got to start thinking like that. Now, the reason we get sad is because there's a a separation that occurs. And so when we lose somebody that we love and that we're close to, we're separated them, no different if they were being deployed, you know, for for months at a time or years at a time, and you were separated from them. That's, That's hard no matter what. But the good thing is, is that you're going to see them again. And this, I wasn't really intending on talking about this this morning, uh, about the death and all of that, but it just kind of came into it because as we think about the spirit, we have to realize our spirits are eternal. And they're going to be with God forever. And the reality that I want to get in you is no one ever really dies. Amen? Okay, let's read another one. Job 32.8. Job 32.8, they're going to put it on the screen for you. We're going to go through a couple of these kind of fast. Job 32.8, it says, But it is the spirit in man, the breath of the Almighty, that makes him understand. You see, here again, we get an idea of what the spirit is. It literally is the breath of God in you. It is a measure and a portion of God's spirit. Now, I want to show you this in 1 Corinthians 14. Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to illustrate how these things work. I think it's going to make it a little more concrete for you. 1 Corinthians 14, chapter 2. Paul is talking about uh, speaking in tongues. And some of you, you know, you may not be as familiar with that. And we're not going to get into, you know, too much of speaking in tongues and those things. But I want you to see a point here. Um, if you, if you want more information on that, we've been going through the book of Acts on Wednesday nights, and we've been talking about that some in the, in the beginning of the book of Acts. But notice what it says here, 1 Corinthians 14, 2. He's talking about, Paul's talking about something that's very foreign to the natural mind, which would be the soul part of us, and, and very foreign to our physical bodies. And he, he gets into an area that's almost exclusively spirit. And it's hard for people to understand. And see, that's why people have such a hard time with speaking in tongues, because they don't under, it's, a, it's a very spiritual exercise that doesn't come natural to the natural uh, mind and disciplines. But this is how he describes it. He says, For one who speaks in a tongue, or one who speaks in tongues, speaks not to men but to God. Wow, what an interesting concept. 
He says, when a person is praying in tongues, they're not talking to man. He said, well, their, their mouth is moving, things are coming. He says, yeah, but it's different. He said, they're not talking to man. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. See, for, for us that just think very carnally minded, very naturally minded, this sounds so strange and so weird. We're like, what? What is he talking about? You're speaking in tongues. He says you're not even talking to man. Something's coming out of your mouth, but you're not talking to man. You're talking to God. That's right. That's right. He says, for one who speaks in tongues speaks not to men, but to God. There's been a lot of misunderstanding surrounding this. He said, for no one understands him. No one, no human being understands what he is saying because what he's uttering is a mystery in the Spirit. So when a person, someone who's filled the Spirit and praying in tongues, what is happening is their Spirit is praying directly to God. They don't understand it. Man wouldn't understand it. But there's something being prayed directly to God. So, you're, so you can see where your Spirit is very active, but your body and your mind are almost not involved at all. Why? Because that's the realest part of you. And, but, and, and this is why people have a hard time understanding this, because they don't have a proper understanding of what man is. Verse 14, look, he explains it in another way. He says, for if I pray in tongues, my spirit prays. Everybody say, my spirit prays. My spirit prays. Did you know your spirit could pray? Because you think, I, I think most of us think when we pray, my mouth is moving and my mind is involved, right? I'm, I have thoughts up here and those are coming out of my mouth and that's what prayer is. Well, he said there's a different kind of prayer. He said, because if I pray in tongues, my spirit prays, but my mind is totally unfruitful, or you could say uninvolved. So you could see where the soul is not, the, the mind and the soul is not involved, but the spirit is praying. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, just listen. Just be open-minded to it, because there's, you may not understand everything that's going on here. You may not understand everything there is to know about this. That's why I said earlier, I think we know most about the body, and we know a little bit about the, the soul, but we understand the least when it comes to spiritual things. And there are things going on in the spiritual realm and in the spiritual world that we don't know anything about. I, I love the passage in the Old Testament, I believe it was Elisha, where he was standing there and they had some armies coming against him and his, uh, his servant was there and they were looking and his servant was all afraid and he said, what are we going to do? Uh, these armies are coming against us. We don't know what they're going to do. And Elisha says, Lord, would you open his eyes? Would you open his eyes so he could see? And all of a sudden, his, his spiritual eyes. Because see, he was looking in the natural. All he could see was the physical army coming against him. He, Elijah said, would you, Lord, would you open his eyes? He opened his spiritual eyes and all of a sudden he saw chariots of fire, sur angels surrounding the whole, the whole valley. And he, Elijah looked at him and he said, listen, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. You just can't see it. Because you're looking with your physical eyes. You did. So that was there all along. Those chariots of fire, those angels, that spiritual assistance, all of that was there. But he could not see it with his physical eye because it, it wasn't something you could discern with your body. You had to know it by the Spirit. I doubt Elijah could see it, but in his spirit he knew. He said, I don't have to see it to know it. I am surrounded and protected by chariots of fire, by angels of God. I know it by my spirit. I know it. I don't have to see it with my physical eye. So when Elijah said, God, would you open his eyes? He said, he ain't seeing what I know is going on in here. So there's a big difference between your spirit and between your physical body and between your soul. So, verse 14 back there, he says, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Well, he says, so what am I to do? Well, I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. You see, a lot of people only know about praying with their mind. That's the only kind of prayer... Many people in this room, only kind of prayer you've ever experienced. But he says, that's only one kind of prayer. He said, there's another kind of prayer where you pray with your spirit and your, and your mind is not involved. 
So he said, for I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? He said, well, I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. He said, I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. Now, my point was not to get super involved in that issue, but just to show you the way that, that, that there might be some things going on with your spirit that you just don't have full understanding of yet. And there might be some things that you haven't accessed yet that, that you can access by the Spirit of God. And, but sometimes we're so natural-minded, we're so carnal-minded, we think that's all there is. But as we talk about fellowship with God, here's what you have to understand. The Bible tells us that God is a spirit. And those who worship Him, those who interact with Him, will do so by their spirit. And if you don't understand the Spirit, if you don't understand how that works, you're going to be frustrated. You're going to be frustrated when you go to prayer and only thing that's engaged is your body and your soul. Now, you'll get a measure. You'll get some benefit of it because your spirit is working and active. It's involved in that process even if you don't know how to use it. But when you really start to see a difference in your relationship with God is when your spirit is communicating with God's spirit. When what's happening on the stage, for example, let's use this as an example, in worship, where you just about shut out the body and the mind part of it. And there's something spiritual that's happening up here that is coming into your spirit down there. That's where you begin to receive real strength from God. If, if, if all we're doing is in the natural, let's just say, well then, if the singing's not just right, or the instruments are not just right, right or something's out of tune, and, you, and you're thinking about all that, and you're watching, and you're looking, and you're going, oh man, that so-and-so's hair is out of place this morning. Man, why'd, why'd she wear that outfit? That looks weird. You know, if that's what you, you're not getting anything from it. Because it's a spiritual exercise. And if all you know how to do is worship with your body and your mind, you're, it's going to be very limited what you get out of it. But what, when you learn to use your spirit to interact with God, and it is learned, when you learn to use your spirit to interact with God, you're going to receive what you never thought was possible. You're going to receive strength and energy that Paul and Jesus and all we're talking about. It's, it's not just a mental and a physical exercise to engage with God. Even when preaching is going forth. Even when the sermon is going forward, you can just hear with this ear and it, it'd be limited what you get out of it. But see, your spirit is starving for the Word of God. Your spirit is so hungry for the Word of God. And anytime your spirit hears truth, anytime your spirit hears the life-giving words of God, it's just like a feast. Your spirit is just eating that up. And some of us... You know, we're distracted and we're looking and we're walking around and we're doing this and we're doing... And I'm thinking, man, you're, you're missing a meal that you need so bad right now. That because your spirit needs to be fed. And the Word of God feeds our spirit. That's why other than just on Sundays, I listen to podcasts when I'm driving, when I'm getting dressed, I listen to podcasts, I listen to the Word of God because I know that my spirit has to be fed. You know, I've told you guys this before, but... When I, was a, when I was a kid, my mom would put on preaching tapes while I would sleep at night. And they would just, it was those old cassette tapes. And they would just play front and back, front and back all night. And that's how I fell asleep every night. And you go, well, you can't hear it when you're asleep. Yeah, but your spirit never sleeps. Your spirit never sleeps. And I don't know what happened to me. All I know, when I was 15, I had more word in me than I knew what to do with. I, I didn't even think I was really listening or paying much attention to those sermons. But when I got saved, and, and all, there was like a light bulb that went off in my spirit all of a sudden, just like this morning. I'm talking, all of a sudden I'm pulling this scripture from here and this one over here, and I'm going, oh, I'm connecting all this. How could that happen? Because that word is in your spirit. That word is in your spirit. And it, it's, always, it's always there. So... We go, well, my memory's limited. I can't remember those scriptures. Yeah, but your, your spirit has no memory problems. There's unlimited amount of information that can be in your, in your spirit. I know we're getting into some things that you're like, oh, I don't know, my head's kind of spinning now. But bottom line, I want you to understand is the, the realest part of you is a spirit, but it's the part that we know least about. So we've got to be open-minded to go, I need to learn more about that. 
I need to be more interested in that. When I'm reading the Bible, when I'm praying, when I'm worshiping, let me try to engage my spirit and not just my mind and my body. And I promise you, the Bible says that when you draw near to God, He'll draw near to you. He knows you don't know everything about it. He knows you don't have perfect under He knows none of us do. But when you make an effort and you go after God and you seek Him with all of your heart, the Bible says you'll find Him. You'll find it. You seek Him with all of your heart and you'll find Him. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's stand on our feet this morning.